Miroslav, thank you so much for joining me today and for visiting Biola University to talk about suffering in the good life, resilience, uh, um, the human response to really the universal impact of, of suffering and pain in our lives. Great to be back in Southern California. Yes, glad right to have you. Biola. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wonder if, if we could start um, at the level of what is a good life? You've written on flourishing. And you said that um, there are competing visions of the good life. Um, everyone wants a good life. Everyone disagrees about what a good life is. I wonder if you'd articulate what you take the good life to be. Yeah, it's one of those terms that, uh, that has a life of its own. Okay. Uh, and it lives in kind of particular subcultures in a different way. Um, think of uh, an issue of architectural digest. Uh, entitled The Good Life, yeah, and right. then uh, subtitle was Fabulous Homes <laughs> from Around the World. <laughs> That's a kind of... Uh, lifestyle. Lifesty lifestyle, it's kind of opulence association yeah. With, yeah. The, with, with the good life. Um, that, uh, I tend to think in terms of uh, good life, uh, <coughs> or actually various conceptions of, of good life, to have three formal components. Hmm. Somehow, life is going well, for a person mm -hmm. or for a community, for the world, in fact. Um, I act in a way that's responsible. Yes. I lead yeah. my life mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. and I feel rightly. Right. So circumstances or circumstantial component mm -hmm agential component, agency of a person, and kind of emotional component, and all three of them combined together go into what we think and experience as, uh, as the good life. Now, different traditions will emphasize one or the other, and these three shouldn't be understood as a three independent stool of a good life chair. <laughs> right. But rather they bleed into one another, Certainly. inform one another. Um, and uh, I, I think in the Christian tradition, they're expressed uh, with terms uh, like righteousness would be agential mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. uh, peace would be the circumstantial side uh -huh. and maybe pinnacle of emotional, um, uh, fulfillment would be joy in the Christian tradition. Uh, yes. And so if you have these three interpenetrating one another, you have something of sense of the good life. And then we can uh, explicate each one of them, what, what it takes. Yeah. And With those as standards, um, I mean, not to, not to burst the bubble too soon, I can think about, I mean, it's, it's easy to imagine life not going well. Mm. It's easy to imagine ourselves failing to act well in light of those circumstances. Mm -hmm. and, it's, yeah. and it's certainly um, familiar to know the, the pain of not feeling rightly, um, uh, right. to be disordered and chaotic in, yeah. in our emotional lives. So I wonder, um, let's overlay that, that understanding of the good life with, I mean, can, can a life full of suffering, existential crises and, and pain, can that be called a good life? Well, in, in certain ways, um, all of our lives uh, are caught in a kind of journey away into the goodness of our lives that we experience. We experience it always in a broken way, mm -hmm. in uh, a way that causes us to celebrate as well as in the way that causes us to, to mourn. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, in the Christian tradition, that is the eschatological vision, so that the life and the goodness of life it always is there uh, on a journey to this uh, uh, eschatological mm -hmm. fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, uh, we, can, we won't have fully good life mm -hmm. <laughs> with experiences of uh, brokenness, but we can have a good life. And then one has to ask also, how, how are these various components in the Christian tradition uh, aligned? And you can sometimes be in a situation where just because you live a good life in its agential dimension, because you act rightly, yeah. you experience life not going <laughs> well and isn't good in yeah. circumstantial uh, dimension. Yes. So, so you've got not only all of them, Fisher going through mm -hmm. all of them, mm -hmm. but also 
sometimes situations where you have to sacrifice one over the other. And we have tended to, in a contemporary culture to uh, install circumstances as the most important dimension of, uh, of our lives. I think in the Christian tradition, without negating importance of circumstances, is the agency that is important. Indeed, some mm -hmm, of the suffering mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that is paradigmatic in the Bible, like suffering of Christ, yeah. comes as a result of trying to make circumstances as well as agency, okay. as well as an emotions of others uh, to express the good life. Yeah, you, you, I mean, you've said this about just this topic. My entire world is not defined by the circumstances in which I find myself. I transcend those circumstances in relationship to God, and therefore I'm enabled also to be an agent that will transform and change those circumstances if the opportunity arises. Mm. So now there's this component of transformation and change, True. and that's a really important component of what it means to be an agent. That's right, that's right. I, and I think, I think there's a kind of agency toward the self Mm -hmm. And there's an agency toward the circumstances okay. as well. And some of the agency toward the self is, in a strange way, also already agency toward the circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, again, not to diminish the need to transform the objective features of the circumstances in which we find ourselves, but also a great deal of our enjoyment of the world um, and uh, comfort with circumstances is tied to our expectations yes. <laughs> and tied to the way in which we read what we are experiencing because we never have just the thing there, right? Mm. Uh, I am, circumstances are such that I'm always already in relation to whatever the objective realities yeah. are. And we're interpreting my, them all the time. That's right. So my agency in relating is a fundamental dimension of the circumstances themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, attention to then the way in which I relate to circumstances, to myself in, in those circumstances, I think is also fundamental to the good life. Yeah. Uh, so, so you can't, uh, you can put it uh, um, this way, say if you take an, uh, uh, t take an illustration from a particular domain of our lives, say economic domain. You cannot sell, solve economic problem by economic means alone. <laughs> right. You cannot solve economic problems by con however much production and just mm. uh, distribution you undertake. Mm. You still haven't resolved that, that uh, issue. And the reason is because economic problem isn't out there. It's in my relationship to yeah. the circumstances. Yeah, they're symptomatic and expressive of some kind of I internal disorder. Yeah. Uh, perhaps internal just to the self, but internal also to relations that's to that, each other. That's right, exactly. And because the, the two, again, uh, reinforce each other, how I relate to others, and mm -hmm. how they relate to me. Um, uh, of course, it will be a mistake then simply to say, well, the only thing you need to do change your attitude. <laughs> then you, 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 you kind of, you, you'd knock, uh, to go back to the beginning of our conversation, you'll knock off one of the, stu one of sure. the legs of the good life stool and you topple over. Yeah. 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 So I think each one, one of them has its own integrity, but they're uh, bleeding into one. Mm, indeed. Psychologists that work on post-traumatic growth are consistently finding that agency is one of those factors mm. that contributes to the ability to, to make positive change in the wake of suffering. Uh, that, uh, that our sense of agency, keeping that intact mm -hmm. through a process of suffering, through a process of pain or injustice or oppression, is, is deeply connected to our ability to make sense of and find meaning in and be able to kind of grow more resilient or stronger through that suffering. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you might comment on, on a kind of like, a s from a theological perspective, the kind of psychic nature of, of losing agency, kind of undergoing suffering in a way that kind of strips us of our control, strips mm -hmm. us of our ability to make an impact. Because this is, I think, now we're talking about suffering at the most dire level. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think most of the, especially for us moderns, because we tend to read ourselves and understand ourselves implicitly as, um, of sovereign in, in individuals, yeah. owners of ourselves and our actions, that, that kind of sense of individual sovereignty yeah. is uh, deeply felt, not just theorized, but deeply felt right. uh, um, 
understanding of the uh, of the self. I'm the captain. Uh, and if you lose, uh, one of the most difficult aspects of suffering is kind of the loss of the ability to control the mm. environment, mm. kind of letting go. And the self that, that what, what's so troubling about suffering uh, often is that, that you end up with a self that as you say, often is able to exert some agency, but that agency is a, is a kind of curtailed. Mm. And often if you can't quite exert agency that you think you want to exert, you perceive yourself as not exerting agency. Yeah. And there's a kind of a loss of ability to kind of relate and be in certain sense uh, in charge on account mm -hmm. of false expectation of what it might uh, need, I, it might need to be the case for me to be in charge. Yeah. Um, you know, but one of, one of the things that I find uh, puzzling about uh, suffering, and I'm not sure exactly that I know how to clearly think about it, but it seems to me intuitively and theologically right that one of the possible sources of growth from suffering mm -hmm. is concerns precisely the loss also <laughs> of certain sense yes. of agency and certain sense of who I am and investment in, in who I am. It's only when I l kind of let go of that. And Losing yourself, you lose yourself. We, 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 When I lose myself, right? Ah. The, the self is always constructed, right? Yeah. But, but mm -hmm. when my, I lose my constructed mm -hmm. when suf uh, self, when suffering yeah. contributes to losing my constructed self, sometimes often falsely constructed self, the possibilities open up right, there's this kind of for saying, transformation. They're saying goodbye to the false self, the false notions that are kind of setting our, ourselves up, um, perhaps as a, perhaps in a kind of idolatry, uh, a, sense of, a sense of control that, that too closely approximates the kind of control yeah. that only God has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then kind of that stripping away, you said that leads to a transformation. It, it, it could lead. It can. <laughs> That's not, right. Not necessarily. Not necessarily, right. But it, it can, uh, especially if one doesn't, s uh, if, um, if one thinks of, kind of um, the, this, the work of breaking down hmm. as simply a, a kind of a negative work, uh, yeah. as a kind of demolition work of somebody yeah. who is my enemy and doesn't want the integrity of me to be there, whether that's an uh, actual enemy or a kind of uh, symbolic sure. uh, kind of uh, yeah. kind of enemy, uh, then 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 it becomes more difficult to kind of put yourself uh, in a sense together. If it's merely demolition, mm -hmm. but if you can perceive how through all these, what might be possibly able to emerge through demolitions. I think yeah. that's also partly, partly, partly the agency, yeah. so that the kind of sense of, of the positive, uh, notwithstanding the demolition work, remains. Right? Sure. And I think you earlier spoke about the sense of agency of the self, that mm. this conditional possibility of resilience yeah. throughout suffering, mm. and I think some of that may be, may, may be in that. And obviously if you, if you feel that you are in the suffering protected, yeah. if you feel that in the midst of your suffering, how difficult it is, you cannot be at the most fundamental yeah. level undone. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, that creates the possibility to always expect uh, and yeah. hope for something new. Yeah. There's one element of response to suffering that is, is as we've been discussing, agency. And that's, that's so much in the moral realm. It's in, it's in the realm of action and human, human um, attempts at control. I wonder if we could transition here a little bit to another kind of response to suffering, and that is a kind of attempt to understand, mm -hmm. a kind of knowledge. And some of your recent work um, in, in interpreting uh, Job's kind of uh, psychic destruction and demolition, uh, the kind of suffering that he undergoes in his life that we learn about in that, that scripture, um, it leads to a kind of silence you say, a kind of unknowing. Yeah. And, and so I wonder if you might talk about the nuances there, about how, how can approach a, um, a response to suffering that, that, that might have something to do with unknowing and, and our silence in the wake of it. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, su suffering is always a, a major challenge to our knowing. Uh, challenge in terms of what's going on, and in particular challenge in terms of what's going to happen. Mm. Uh, what can I expect <laughs> um, yeah. as I'm undergoing the suffering? What, what, are, what are the hopes? Mm -hmm. And so the kind of fate of hope uh, and faith of uh, and, and understanding of what's happening and what's going to uh, yeah. ensue is what challenges us in a, in a profound right. kind of way. Yeah. And uh, um, I, I think we sometimes want to explain suffering, want to yes. control it by uh, various kinds of means. Mm -hmm. uh, practically, mm -hmm. sometimes we want to control it, mm -hmm. right? but we also control it intellectually. Yeah. Um, and often we come to too quick of a closures uh, because we can't quite project what it is. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I think that we sometimes cannot, in the suffering, project rightly as to what would we want to decide. We don't know what's going on and we don't know what ought to happen. We know what we want, yeah. but it's not always clear that what we want can happen or that it is a right and appropriate thing yeah. to, uh, to happen. And I think this moment of not knowing is so fundamental. You see it in, in Job, and Job realizes uh, after this uh, terrifying speech of God yeah. um, that, that, that he can't quite understand his life, that, that he needs to live in the realm of trust. You see it, mm -hmm. you see it with Jesus hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken yeah. me? Uh, a kind of dashing of hopes that, that happens. You see it in Paul also, which is very, very fascinating with yeah. him. When, when he says, uh, well, we don't know how to pray. Now, you, you think that person who suffers exactly knows how to pray. I know what to ask, what, you know. Yeah, I, because I, I, they're like, somehow more connected to even like the person of Christ in, in that. But, but also, but also in my suffering, I just get rid of the, this thing. I can exactly. imagine a very different life very easily. What's yeah. gonna, what's gonna come? A and yet, Apostle Paul writes there, we don't know what to pray, and this is this is kind of a, yeah. a sense of unknowing, which is, I think, a condition of possibility of growth. And he talks about unknowing, yeah. um, in a sense of every hope contains darkness. Mm. And mm. this sense of darkness of the future into which we go, whether we are suffering or, as a matter of fact, whether we, li we live just our ordinary life, yeah. <laughs> uh, except we think that everything's bright uh, and clean sure. and clear w when we don't suffer. When we suffer, we know that, that the, the future is really uh, uh, problematic. But this darkness yeah. of the future, darkness of the hope, I think is a con recognition of it and non-understanding yeah. in, in face of it is fundamental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there the scripture, uh, we see through a glass darkly. Yeah. We hope in things that are not seen. Yeah, exactly. Um, the dark side of hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? We yeah. often speak in terms of glimmers of hope, right? Yeah. There, there, where there is light. But, but the dark side of hope is looking, is looking out into the dark. Well, and, 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 and sometimes uh, wandering, sometimes uh, sight where that dark is also silent. Right, right. Because we tend to think of, uh, of hopes uh, in, kind of in, the, in the vocabulary of my own teacher, Jürgen Moltmann. Yeah. We, yeah. we tend to think of hope uh, in terms of optimism. Or uh, God's promises fulfilled. Or some, yeah, yeah, yeah. some kind of uh, very specific outcomes sure. that will take us from here mm -hmm. to, to what, it, what is there, rather than hope being something, that, something new that comes to us. Yeah. In a kind of surprising way, so that Which every would you would you say that's a forward-looking kind of hope as a like looking the, the, from from this vantage point, like from earthly vantage. It, it's a it's it's a hope that's given, uh, whose reason has given attempts to extrapolate mm. from what is now to what is going to to be. Okay, all right. <laughs> but the hope... Eschatological, perhaps? So it's some, but, but, but this is, this is actually eschatological structure of our lives, yeah. of anticipations, too, I think. Mm -hmm. Because 
uh, y you know what you might want, but th I, I think we, we, we also know that uh, hopes can be very much illusory, con con projections, yeah. constructs of, yeah. our, of our imagination uh, and can kind of reinforce mm. the, the oppressions that, mm -hmm. we are, that we are suffering yeah. in many ways. Um, and so this, I mean, I, I, I see it almost paradigmatic. Uh, I, I don't know, experiences of, of love uh, are, are, are really uh, extraordinary. And so you, you have hopes, right? right. You, you have kind of images of what uh, the person with whom you fall in love will be and look like. Yeah. And so you kind of stretch yourself toward that. You see uh, the whole relationship before you. I mean. But 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 you you've kind of identified what that kind of is in your in your head, yeah. and you're kind of trying to yeah. match. Yeah. But the, the the most fortuitous and most fulfilling is when you recognize something and you say, ah, "Now I see what I was looking for." Yeah. <laughs> All right. The kind of the the, the fulfillment hmm. gives you the eyes to see what is it that you wanted. Sure. Uh, as you're seeking yeah. fulfillment, right? right. And th this is a, a magical thing. That, that's why love is magical in this way, mm -hmm. right? Because it is not simply, oh, I, I've wanted this and I just got it. Yeah. It's kind of boring, right? right. <laughs> but I've yeah. been transformed in getting what I was hoping. Yeah. So again, in, in, in Paul and in perhaps Paul's kind of awareness of, of, kind of Job's silence, of non-understanding. Mm -hmm. You say that that honors great suffering in a way that explanatory and justificatory speech cannot and that it is intellectually and morally more honest, this kind of silence of unknowing, fitting the scope of any possible knowledge we could have about both God and the world. Perhaps mm -hmm. more importantly, you say, Paul's non-theotical -the approach, an approach without theodicy, toward suffering stands firmly in the tradition of Exodus, the paradigmatic way of contending with suffering in the Bible. And this is this is encapsulating comment, that God's response to suffering was liberation, not explanation. Right. And that is just, um, there's, some, there's some profoundness there. I wonder if you'd just comment on, on what that means. Yeah, uh, um, so, so, so my sense is that um, one of the things uh, a, a sufferer really doesn't want an explanation. For mm. Most of them, just get me out. Yeah. <laughs> um, do explanation something. does do something. Yeah. Explanation kind of confirms me in the state in which I am. Yeah. Right. In that sense, that there there is a kind of whiff of putting up with suffering in attempts to explain and to justify uh, suffering, right? Uh, so, uh, but, and, and so, so that's kind of one part uh, of, of what I'm trying to, to say. That the other part is that um, in order to understand what each of the events in my life's life means, in order to kind of fit it into some kind of a narrative, mm -hmm. I need to be at the end of my life. <laughs> In order to, because uh, every, as, as my years go, I reinterpret uh, all the events that suddenly realize, oh, possible meanings mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. I think that's the same is true for, for the entire human history. So that yeah. if the Odyssey is possible, it's possible from the end of history, yeah. backwards. Okay. Uh, because only then the clarity kind of comes. And I think that's part of the reason why um, uh, whether in Exodus, whether uh, or Apostle Paul, he doesn't spend a lot of time trying to kind of explain mm -hmm. or justify. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's uh, he's very much uh, uh, resting on the hope of transformation. What I find so provocative about this is the kind of virtue of unknowing, mm -hmm. the kind of virtue that it looks like is paradoxical, right? Uh, Socrates' wisdom being in that he knew he wasn't wise. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, knowing only what we don't know. Uh, but this kind of speaks to kind of a rightful and fitting place, um, kind of a, our place as creatures, our creatureliness, yeah. uh, as in relation to, to our creator. And I want to come back and, and perhaps close with some thoughts again about the, the groanings of the spirit mm. as a response. So, if, so in the wake of kind of silence, a deafening 
silence of unknowing in the, in the, in the wake of suffering, there is a space for prayer still, mm -hmm. but is a different kind of prayer. Yeah, it's a, it's a, th th that's Paul's point when he says we don't know how to pray. Because praise, if it's intercess intercessory, uh, well, you kind of specify, uh, or order, you order the Christmas gift from God. Yeah, those, yeah, please. and, and uh, I want this kind of addition of, uh, <laughs> of whatever it is. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah, Ordering right. God around. And, uh, exactly, right. So, so, so that's generally what we, what, yeah. what we tend, to, tend to do. Uh, but kind of, kind of a sense of uh, stepping back and understanding that I don't quite know what it is that will make yeah. for fulfillment yeah. of my life, but that my life is in the hand of someone who hears the groans, mm -hmm. who groans together with, with me, yeah. uh, and who somehow transforms my groaning into something that can be yeah. my own future, in fact, right. <laughs> that is probably better for me than what I, at this point, were able, uh, were able to imagine yeah. it to be. What I find so wonderful about this is it, it kind of occupies that space between knowledge and agency. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this kind of prayer, the prayers of the Spirit, which, which come forth in groanings and mm -hmm. longings and unfulfilled desires, kind of fills that, that that personal space that's somewhere between knowledge and somewhere between actions and somewhere between feeling, mm. but it's, but it's almost, it's almost uh, uniquely divine, the kind of things that come through. And it makes sense of our, of our, our, I think our deep intuition, not just a Christian intuition, but a human intuition that, that sometimes the only thing to, to do in response to suffering is to be silent. Right, right, right. A and, th and then, uh, uh, the, the kind of the, the, the silence that, that envelops a longing, right? <laughs> it's it's not a it's not a dumb silence fully, right? Uh, it's 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 all tense, mm -hmm. fulfilled, filled with longing, and uh, often a, a groaning, uh, a sense that th th this is silence of things as they ought not be. <laughs> Feels like unactualized potential. It's yeah, like, yeah, something like, like that. Like some tension that just is stirring below the surface, right. and and if only it could meet its its end, then there'd yeah. be some kind of resolution. But it feels so far. Yeah, and and I I think that that kind of a to be in that darkness, especially when when we are undone by heavy suffering, it, it, it's it's a it's a huge challenge. Uh, how does one do that? I mean, in life of Christ, you see that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In a, in a sense, it, it, it kind of expresses the, the fundamental trust that was perceived to have been betrayed uh, at the very last hour yeah. of life. Yeah. And yet what happens after? He just says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken is the last word. Yeah the curtain in the temple splits in, into two, the graves open, the response of God. I mean, yeah. I put it something this way, you know, if you address a, a person, polite person will respond, God doesn't say a thing. But how, the way God responds is that the temple yeah. tears, the graves open. Here yeah. you've got this intrusion of the transformative event. Yeah, there's almost like an ontological response. Yes, exactly, exactly. And that is something that is like, maybe expressed in, in the tearing of the temple and the graves opening, but if there's some like deep spiritual reality that has just been exploded. Uh, in a sense, it's a site of a new world emerging. Yeah, something new. Yeah. Miroslav, thank you so much for your time today. This is just rich and uh, I'm looking forward to your future work. Please keep at it. Um, it's always good to be, good to be here, here with you, have conversations with you. Yeah. That's uh, it's wonderful that we can co collaborate. Oh, thank you so much.